Thank you uh, so very much. Uh, it's a great uh, <clears throat> honor to be a part of your conference, uh, of, of your gathering. And um, what I would uh, like, <clears throat> what I would like to do um, over the next um, few minutes in my remarks is to share a little bit uh, with you my um, own experience in uh, working with leaders, working with organizations, and particularly uh, in dealing with uh, challenges of disruptions. And then uh, I'm looking forward to uh, a, a conversation with you around that. And um, many, it has been said many times that we live in unprecedented times and that we live in a moment of disruption, not only in industries, but also in society, and not only on a single country level, but really on a planetary scale. And um, that's regardless whether you're a leader of a business organization or whether you work in the leadership of public organizations or NGOs, that's the situation we all face. We face challenges of profound disruptions. And um, what does disruption really mean? Disruption uh, means that, in a nutshell, that the future is going to be different from the past and the present state. And uh, usually, if you look at this picture here, so there is a lot we know. If you picture ourselves in the current moment here on the left-hand side, there's um, a lot that we know about that. Then when it comes to the emerging future, right? The, um, so uh, the state of uh, tomorrow, basically, that's usually what we know less about. And what we know least about is this, the journey from here to there, particularly if the emerging future is going to be significantly different from the status quo. And that's what I would like to talk uh, uh, about a little bit with you and uh, to share with you what, uh, what can be learned and what does it take to really move from this side to the other side of the spectrum. And in a nutshell, what I'm going to share with you is what it takes is a journey, a journey which is a true leadership journey, which means it has both an outer side and an inner side. And the outer side has to do with going to the edges of your own system, looking at your own business, at your own organization, at your own sector, through the eyes from the people at the edges. And um, the inner journey has to do with this process of suspending our old habits of judgment, looking at reality through, uh, through the perspective of other stakeholders, and then uh, the process of letting go and letting come. And uh, before moving more into that, I would like to uh, share with you kind of the methodological background. So I uh, was born and raised in Europe, came here to MIT in the United States some 25 years ago because I was attracted by the school of organizational learning and systems thinking that is, has um, been always part of the MIT ecosystem here. And um, what I'm going to share with you is really a systems view on leadership, a systems view on how to, as a leader, connect with and respond to challenges of disruption. And um, from a systems view, so what does systems thinking really mean in a nutshell? If you really boil it down to just one distinction, it's this. Systems thinking means that uh, it starts with a distinction between symptoms at the top, when you look at this iceberg model here, and the root issues beneath. The root issues, the deeper root issues that give rise to these symptoms. And what does leadership mean from a systems thinking view? Leadership means that you should not, as a leader, just react against these symptoms, right? The symptoms of the crisis. But as a leader, what you do is that you should A, understand, and B, address these deeper root issues that are at play in the situation you are dealing with. So 
the specific, and when you look at these three words, structures, like, uh, you know, policies, for example, right? Thought, that's this kind of paradigms of thought, the, the, the way we think, which gives rise to these structures. And then the deeper sources, the sources of creativity, sources of who we are, sources of our own energy. Those three words basically summarize the evolution of systems thinking over the past, I would say, uh, 50 plus years which move kind of from structures to the mental models, right? The paradigms of thought. And from there in the past decade or two to these deeper sources of profound innovation and change. So let me summarize this approach with uh, four simple principles and sentences. Number one, you cannot understand a system unless you change it. Famous the Kurt Lewin, the founder of Action Research, kind of which founded really kind of this school of thinking and this school of learning, which is very much part of the uh, MIT ecosystem uh, here in the uh, Boston area. Number two, you cannot change the system unless you transform consciousness. So when it comes to change, um, you cannot change a system unless you transform the mindsets of the people that you're working with. Uh, so what this basically says is when you go in your organization through a process of real change, you really need to address all four of these levels here, all four of them, from symptoms to structures to paradigms of thought to the deeper sources. And if you only address the first one or two, you are just stuck in reacting to the patterns of the past. So that's number two. You cannot change a system unless you transform consciousness or mindsets, right? Because if you don't, if you just tinker around with some new processes, some new structures, but you do not change how people see and make sense of and think about the situation, then the same people will recreate the same problems that you had before. All right, that's number two. Number three, you cannot transform consciousness unless you make a system see and sense itself. So now we talk about the how, right? How do you change mindsets? And what I learned over the years is this, you have to make a system see and sense itself. Now, we already know that from individual change, right? When I go through a period of profound change uh, as an individual, what do I do as a leader, right? I get a coach, right? I get one other person at least kind of with whom I can talk this through, who can mirror me maybe, kind of feed back some of the things that she or he is uh, observing. Now, the same applies on an organizational and systems level, but often we are missing these mirroring infrastructures, these deep listening infrastructures. So um, if, an, if as an organization you go through a period of profound change, you need more than that, that organization. You need a holding space, in other words, right, for that change to be successful. And then lastly, the key for awareness-based leadership is to realign attention and intention. So let me unpack that a little bit. So basically what I'm saying is, um, and what you already know probably if you're a leader is what it is as a leader that you pay attention to, that's where the energy goes. So energy follows attention. Wherever you as a leader and you as a human being pay attention to, that's where the energy goes, both your own energy but also the energy of the team around you. And the key really for um, successful leadership, in my view, is to realign attention with intention. So to put you, rather than just always react and have your focus on a reality that you want to avoid, 
place your attention on the reality that you want to bring into uh, into the world. So this deeper view of leadership, the first time I, I came across um, uh, this um, deeper line of uh, leadership work was in talking with leaders, in listening to leaders. So I did an um, interview uh, story, uh, I did an interview study with 150 innovators in business and society and science and ask them about their own journey of bringing profound innovation and change into the world. And here is what, how one of them, the late CEO of Hanover Insurance, summarized his many years of, ex, as, as, of experience leading transformation and change as a CEO. He said, the success of an intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. So the success of what I do as a change maker, he says, depends on the inner place from that I operate. So in other words, what counts is not only what leaders and change makers do, not only how they do it, the process they apply, but the inner place from, from that they operate. And today, I would summarize this inner place with these three terms, accessing these three instruments of knowing, which is curiosity, compassion, and courage. Or to use another word, open mind, open heart, open will. So the key really for responding to our challenges of disruption is this, stop downloading, stop reenacting your patterns of action and thought and pay attention to the situation in a more deep in, in a more deeper way, and that's really kind of um, what the essence is of what we call the U process or awareness-based systems change. Seeing with fresh eyes, which means suspending our old habits of judgment, and empathizing with the perspective of other stakeholders in your system, which means seeing the situation through their eyes, not just kind of from your silo view. And then this process of letting go and letting come, which means connecting with emerging future possibilities and then bringing them into the world. So when you double click on the word leadership, what it, you know, the word root, the Indo-European word root of the English word leadership, what it literally means is going forth stepping from one territory to another one. So it literally means to sense and actualize emerging future possibilities. That's, I think, at the heart of leadership, particularly if you face a moment of disruption. And that requires, for that to be successful, it requires these three capacities, opening the mind, opening the heart, opening the will. But what is it? I mean, we all know these examples here, maybe more from our micro environments and our teams and maybe organizations um, when, you know, when we have these lucky moments that we are part of. But what's going on in the larger society around us very often and partly even in our own organizations, it is the precise opposite. So it's an amplification, a profound amplification of ignorance, hate, and fear, aka closing the mind, closing the heart, closing the will. So if you want, it's like a freeze reaction of the human mind, right? Not a response of opening these deeper capacities of knowing. And what that results into is blinding ourselves Right, which we so it's the the polit the uh, the post truth politics, right? So, and you can see Trumpism, right? I, I not only mean the person, but the whole phenomenon of Trump, kind of twelve thousand lies in office, right? Why after taking office, so that he reached the twelve thousand lies and false statements um, in mid July. So it's kind of blinding ourselves. And when you blind yourself and you deal with real problems like the coronavirus, 
you enter a rude awakening, right? That's kind of what the story that our country here in the US is going through now. And the same, of course, happens with climate, right? We are in denial of the climate challenges and kind of the same dynamics play out. So blinding, the second phenomenon here is desensing, right? Rather than empathizing, we are entrenching and desensing means we are getting stuck inside our own filter bubbles, kind of inside, you know, a fragmentation of society, us versus them. So we are not lo no longer feeling what people feel outside of our own bubble. And then rather than letting go of the past and connecting with the emerging future, we are holding on to the past, right? Make America great again. It's reorienting ourselves back to the past. And we move into these patterns, you know, patterns of manipulation, othering, blaming others, violence and eventually self-destruction, which is what you see going on, right? When you, for example, look at the public life of the past four years here in the United States. Now, that's the world we live in, right? So why is that? So the last past four years, this part of the equation has become a lot more powerful, but there's also a lot going on here. And it's also uh, worth kind of paying attention to. But as a leader, we have to not only place our attention here, but also engage these realities. That's just the reality we are dealt with. And I want to um, suggest um, a perspective on that that I hope will be helpful for you, which is I found it useful in terms of leadership to think about you know, this question, how do we really address this upper spectrum here, which is a big part of social dynamics that we see currently going on. And what I found is, um, what, what is really helpful is to think about that in terms of three blind spots of not seeing reality, which really needs to the question, can you listen? Can How can we begin to listen and see reality um, that maybe we have been unaware of before. Number two, not feeling. I know something, but I'm not empathizing with that perspective. And that, of course, happens a lot the more our society is falling into parts, into sub-communities, in tribes that no longer talk with each other. And that is, you know, uh, calling for a leadership that really is sensing into the whole field kind of it's kind of where you not only see the larger ecosystem of stakeholders that you're dealing with but you can sense how other members of your stakeholder system are feeling about and experiencing a situation and then the third blind spot is not acting on what we see and maybe what we feel and that is calling for um courage it's calling for activating our true action confidence, our capacity to step into new territories that were unattainable before. So I think that's, you know, maybe that's clearly, I would say, maybe it's an American perspective I'm offering to you, but I have traveled enough <laughs> countries before COVID and I know that this is not limited to the United States. It's a global phenomenon. You will be, I've never been in Peru, unfortunately, as of yet. You are the judge whether or not this is applying to your situation. But I want to end with um, saying something about what it really takes to address these issues. I think essentially it takes two things, right? So uh, one is on a personal level, right? As a leader, as a change maker, I need to develop these deeper capacities, right? Of listening, of you know, seeing through the eyes of other stakeholders and of engaging really with, um, you know, activating our deeper capacities of change, um, not only individually, but also on a, on, a, on a system level and ecosystem level or organizational level. That's one thing. So that's kind of where we have maybe a little more control. But since you're a multi-stakeholder group um, now, um, composed of business leaders, leaders in government, and also leaders in, in civil society and NGOs, I want to also mention 
the other thing going on, and that is necessary to address this upper phenomenon here, to transform this, if everyone is just focusing on their own organization, that's not good enough. Because as leaders, as change makers, when you face a moment of disruption, it's part of your job to A, figure out, kind of have a view on what's going on in the bigger system, and B, be a part of the solution, not only seeing things going in the, into down the drain, into the wrong direction. So I would say what we live in, what we experience in a variety of societies and countries today is this, that we need to develop new infrastructures for innovation on the level of the whole system, on the level of the whole society or the whole country, and particularly in three areas, new learning infrastructures, new democratic infrastructures, and new economic infrastructures. So the new learning infrastructures really are about whole person, whole system learning. The new democratic infrastructures really make democracy a lot more direct, distributed and dialogic, kind of engaging all the different stakeholders that belong to a situation in co-creative problem solving rather than just fighting against each other. And then new economic infrastructures in terms of shifting the mindset from ego to eco, or you, I could also say from a silo view to a systems view. So silo view is, you know, ego system awareness just means I'm just looking at things just from my angle, from my interest. An ecosystem perspective is a true systems view where I understand what it looks like and feels like from the viewpoint of others. So in closing, I think the bigger topic of your gathering is really addressing the profound issues we face at this point, right? Which have to do with planetary healing and civilizational renewal, right? With what is civilizational renewal? It means to really reinvent how we work and live together, right? To reinvent the way we learn together, the way we make together our governance systems, right? AKA democracy and reinvent our economy, right? So how we generate prosperity and well-being for all and not just for a few. So if that's the issue we are working on, right? And one way or another, I understand kind of that's kind of the, the topic of your gathering. Then the real question, I mean, my take on it is this. This is only going to work if we activate co-creative social fields. In other words, co-creative or generative social fields. In other words, if we succeed in, so this will only work if we succeed in helping organizations and stakeholder groups to move from dysfunctional ways of connecting with each other, of interacting with each other, to ways that are more productive and co-creative. So that's what we mean with generative social fields, that we are able to sense and realize emerging future possibilities. That's really what we, the, the most important capacity we need when we face a moment of disruption. And to do this, that's my experience, because I have experimenting with that for the past 20 plus years, we need a support infrastructure. So that's the one thing. I mean, I'm in the field of systems thinking, organization learning. What is it we have learned over the past uh, 50 plus years? One thing, you cannot go through profound change without a support infrastructure. So um, School for Transformation really is just a headline for something that personally I'm trying to contribute towards. Um, because I believe today we live in a society where we know kind of this is the decade of transformation. We need to create profound change in just about every country, in, I mean, in every society in this decade that we are in. Because a lot of the systems that we have that used to work well in the past are no longer in sync with the key challenges that we face today, right? So that's what disruption means. So we know this decade is the decade of transformation. That's clear. 
But what's not clear is where do we develop the leadership capacity to lead this transformation of change? Where do we, the transformation capacity or the transformation literacy, if you want, is not there. And that's what we need to develop. And this is kind of the support structure that you know, I really try to develop and to replicate and to make available at scale. So in my view, uh, this kind of support infrastructure that I call a school for transformation, this is the main thing it should be doing, democratizing the access to transformation capacity or transformation literacy. And because if, if, uh, if the, the access to these methods and tools of uh, awareness-based systems change, uh, if that's only available to a few, um, then we will not be successful in, in, in going through these um, stories and episodes of profound change that we know, given the challenge that we face, we are called for now. So I think that's really the, um, the call of our time. That's where I put my own focus. That's where I um, <clears throat> you know, work from MIT to make that available. MIT as an institution that's committed to open source that's also where we created a platform that allows kind of to, um, um, a free of charge replication of these met methods and tools to make them broadly available, which is what I mean with democratizing access. So, um, but my question to you is, okay, so I share with you this perspective. We live in a moment of disruption and what really counts in a moment of disruption is to develop your own capacity to sense and actualize the emerging future, not just fight the problems, right, or fight the current moment, but really to develop this deeper innovation capacity. And to do that, that we need really um, uh, a journey, right, uh, an outer and an inner journey. And the inner journey, the outer journey has to do with going to the edges and the inner and going to the places of most potential and the inner journey has to do with opening the mind, opening the heart, opening the will. And those are like holding spaces that we need to create for each other. And to do that at the level of scale, really, we need a support infrastructure for that. So that's kind of that's why, you know, I, uh, you know, support organizations and institutions. And I would love to hear from you, kind of what, um, how that uh, fits with your own environment, with your own um, experience of change, and with your own view on uh, what's going on at the current moment, and what are you called to do, kind of as a citizen, as a leader, uh, as a member of your society. Thank you. Thank you, Otto. That was mind blowing, super inspiring. Um, I think that. You know, the framework that you have been working on that you are proposing, um, the first, I have a question before we get into, into Peru and, and how it applies to us is, I would like to hear from you how we got so, so fragmented collectively. You know, when I, when I look at the upper spectrum, um, it, it seems from what I'm seeing that the upper spectrum occupies a whole space it's, it's just so large um how how did we get there what what do you think about that well i would say the this upper space is um it's not entirely new so we always had a version of that earlier in history but what is new is um that it is uh amplified and supercharged in a way we have never seen before. So that's the new thing. And if you look at the, um, so again, so I'm offering you a mostly American perspective, even though, you know, I also, uh, I could comment also on other number of other countries, but from an American point of view, I would say it's, it's very clear. It's, it's like two things are that the two main factors are dark money and, um, surveillance capitalism. So I will say um, a little bit uh, on both. Dark money is basically um, 
uh, money hijacking the political process. So uh, an example is, uh, and you can uh, read that up in the uh, in, in the book, Dark Money. Kind of, it's well documented and studied there. It's when you look at the um, uh, transformation that's going on now. Um, well, what is it that's happening there? So, for example, in the sector of energy, right? We need to move from fossil fuel to renewable energy. Now, dark money in the amount of more than half a billion dollar um, shifted public opinion in the United States. So, in the early 2000s, there was a majority moving towards carbon tax. Um, and then um, there was a group coming together um, and invested half a billion dollar in the climate denial industry, which hijacked public opinion and created doubt about climate science and thereby prevented the uh, carbon tax from going through. So that, that's one example, right? So you have uh, special interest groups through dark money working against the well-being of the whole. But the bigger issue, I think, I mean, that's like, you know, you could say, well, we have versions of that before. So what's uh, what's so new? I mean, it's the scale. So it's the scale of the money that's flowing in. Uh, the financial industry is, is another example, right? And so um, another, uh, but, but I think that's kind of the smaller um, piece. The bigger piece is social media. And it's... Um, so uh, basically, the, if you look at the trillion dollar companies, right, in market evaluation, why are they valued that high? Because they have a different business proposition. And it's based on big data, and it's based on um, churning big data, so which is based on people's experience into inf information that you can use to manipulate behavior, user behavior on the level of the collector. So that's basically the, the, the proposition. And it, it works. Now the problem is, uh, so social media companies, as we all know, uh, maximize their profit by maximizing um, advertising revenues. And that is maximized by user engagement. So how do you maximize user engagement? By activating the upper curve. It's hate, ignorance, so lies, and fear, right? So rage, hate, and fear are the main activators that maximize the user experience. So you can say, yes, it works for them. They are now trillion dollar companies, but it also ruins democracy, right? So, so that's the problem there. It also, uh, is amplifying kind of uh, a rampant phenomenon of depression and anxiety disorder among young people that is by and large propor proportional to, to the use of Facebook and social media. So we could go deeper into that, but I would say those are the two main factors. So then you could ask, well, does that mean technology is the problem? No, technology is not the problem. The problem is our intention that we use to design deploy and use technology. That's the problem. And that's basically calling for a massive space of innovation. I mean, in all fairness, over the past few weeks, we have seen some positive signs of the social media, uh, the, the big data companies, in terms of kind of um, uh, manipulation of the election, uh, the current one, the 2021, not the 2016 one. So there are like some positive signs, but a lot more is, ne is necessary. And that will be one of the key areas of um, societal innovation going forward. And uh, the future will not come out of the US here. It will come out of Europe because in Europe, kind of the, the, the user community has a lot more power and regulatory power to enforce changes that later I think will also uh, uh, be adopted here in the U.S. and in other places. Okay, let me, um, in Peru, because of the pandemic, we have been understanding the problems that we always had, but they have just become a lot more visible. Um, um, obviously, in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, interconnectivity, um, we, we have not been in a good place. The good news is that this has become so visible that I what I see is that the community 
not only the government but also the community and also the the leader the corporate leadership um, is has been stepping in and I I think that we're starting we're moving more on the lower spectrum and I'm very hopeful the answering your questions as to you know can you listen can you sense the field can you activate the courage I think this is happening and this is part of you know what we have been discussing during this event there are a lot of uh, commitments and alliances to to move forward we understand we had the example of chile not long ago uh, you know chile was like oh okay we all want to be like the chileans well it turns out that the system and the, the, the systems that you you mentioned were not really attending the needs of the expectation of the middle class so we have been looking at Chile uh, very closely um, in order to, you know, to prevent that from happening to us. Now, I think that in that journey, um, it can be very easy to lose sight. Um, and the question that I have now is from what you have been studying and also your interactions probably with business leaders or people who are sitting at boardrooms and large companies, do you see uh, large companies incorporating this mindset from the leadership of the C-suite or even you know, from the shareholders' um, point of view, incorporating this new, um, not this, new, this, this view of you know, how we need to work on the lower spectrum so we can, you know, um, fight or, 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 or control the, the upper spectrum. Is that something, is, is it happening? Yeah, so, so maybe, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going, going to respond to that, but let me just add like on your earlier question, a, a third item that, uh, that belongs to this uh, second one, which yes. is, so I, I did say dark money is one factor kind of of amplification and the algorithms, right? So, so of social media is another one uh, that drive, uh, yeah, maximize user engagement. But the third one is somehow with, with media. So somehow that we tend to, when you look at public, um, our public conversation, it's 100% absorbed by the upper half, even though a lot of our experience is also in the lower half, but it doesn't make it for into the public conversation. So that's, I think, that's where leadership starts, because as leaders, we cannot just look at what we want to avoid. We need to put our attention on what we want to create. So we need to realign attention and intention. And in fact, I see a lot, uh, both here in the US and also in other places going on, the corona crisis, as you said, laid bare everything that was already broken before, right? And needs to be addressed in a more, you know, it's not um, sustainable, kind of ne needs to be addressed in a, in a different way. And it also sparked particularly like on a community, on a neighborhood, but also partly in industries, right? It activated new behaviors and new collaborative structures uh, that we haven't seen before. I mean, that's both true between organizations, between companies, when you look at how companies collaborate in part in creating solutions for this profound crisis that we face. Um, and uh, it also is uh, uh, observable on a micro level, right? Kind of how inside organizations through this disruption, a lot more, more fluid ways of organizing have been taking shape. So there's a lot that, and I would also say what we experience is that if we as human beings put our mind on a problem together, we can bend the curve. We can bend the curve of our collective behavior which is amazing. No other species on earth can do that, right? No other species on earth has this capacity to change the rules according to which collective behavior works, to bend the curve, based on realigning attention and intention. So I think there is a, a lot uh, of encouragement and of innovation that we see inside and between organizations and moving forward, we just need to apply the same approaches 
also to the other, particularly the, the climate change and the biodiversity and the social justice. You could say social justice issues, right, that are so, um, so much at the forefront um, of the current uh, crisis. So, yes, there's a lot. And we know from the corona, I mean, I was last night, I was uh, were on the line with a few ministers from Cambodia, right? In their country, they have been very proactive uh, in the corona response. In their entire country, they have 246 cases. That's wow. all. 246 cases. And so it does give you, and then you have on the other end of the spectrum, United States, right? It gives you this spectrum, kind of leadership matters, how we, whether we are in denial of a problem or are leaning into the problem with an open mind, open heart, and then start to act on that, whether we do that timely or delayed makes a huge difference. And, you know, comparing Cambodia or um, Taiwan kind of here with um, the United States, really gives you the full spectrum. Absolutely. All right. Well, Otto, I have like five more questions, but they tell me that our time is up. This was super um, inspiring. I think that having this framework, it really makes you think what you can do, you know, from, the, from a leadership position. We need to address like, you know, the elephant in the room and, and tell things how they are. Um, and I think that there's a lot of goodness in people. And I, in my experience, people who have leadership roles only want to, you know, ex explore and, and, and expand the greater good um, in everything we do from, from the companies and from the countries. But I agree with you that we don't talk about it enough. We don't talk about the consciousness. We don't talk about the intentionality. Sometimes I feel we're on the surface of things. That's what we're discussing. And um, I would be very interested to learn in the future how this conversation is going on the boardrooms as well. Before I close, um, I wanted to tell you yesterday, I had a session with John Elkington and we were talking about green swans. And um, I, I was saying, well, you know, we probably need a new kind of leadership. And he said, absolutely. And just, you know, the theory of you and what Otto Sharma is doing is amazing. I told him that I was going to be talking to you today. And he said, please make sure to say hello to Otto. I'm a super big fan. And only with his mindset, we're going to be able to fly with green swans. So I didn't, I have a note here to, to say that. Um, and with that, I want to thank you again. You are more than welcome to come and visit us in Peru. It would be lovely. And um, maybe you want to say a few words before we say goodbye? Well, thank you so, uh, very much, Delma. Uh, that means a lot. And maybe uh, in, um, in closing, as a closing thought, um, I think um, what, what we can observe today is a little bit like uh, that we need new arenas of you know, how we uh, address some of these issues. And um, in... In the old days, we all often thought about organizational change. I need to make it happen in my organization. But here's what I think applies to organizations today, which is that they're often too big for the small problems, right? The more human and, you know, and too small for the big problems, right? So that really calls for a new entity where change really happens. And we all want to go beyond blah, 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 right? Kind of more talk, yes. right? And hot air, uh, maybe on, on, a, on a country level or something like that, or global level. So I think that the operative question is, where is your ecosystem of change, right? So what, what I mean with ecosystem is the people and stakeholders that you need to engage with in order to change the system. And so I think that's really kind of the ecosystem lens is really the one that's practical because if you're just kind of inside your own organization, it's often too small, right? If you're just out there, just kind of all the big global problems, it's too much, I can't do it. But so in between there is kind of this ecosystem of change. So which, what is it for you, right? That, that's the question. And how can you engage maybe with some of these other stakeholders in a way that is different than uh, you did in the past. 
and really look at the bigger issue together and make sense and figure out how you can maybe develop new patterns and strategies and, and ways of operating. So that would be maybe my closing thoughts because both on an organizational level and also on the nation state level, we know they've, they've, they suffer the same problem, right? Which is too big for the small problems, too small for the big problems. But with an ecosystem approach, we can make it work. Thank you so much, and I wish you a Thank wonderful you. continuation of the process.